I just love walking uninterrupted. Holy cannoli, is that a trap? Uh, probably not. Whoa! Ah, alas. If there had only been some way to prevent this from happening before it happened. <coughs> it's a pretty rare case that a DM era monster is remembered by non-practicing Yu-Gi-Oh! nostalgics for what its exact effect is as opposed to for how cool it looks and how relevant it is in the story. There are definitely exceptions, such as Man Eater Bug or Exodia, although for the latter there tends to be an impression that it's a summonable monster with infinite attack or something, but for the most part, the fame is saved for effectless dragons of opposing eyes and colors. However, if you were to ask anybody what Jinzo does, you'd likely get a very simple answer. Trap card? More like crap card! And they would be right, because Jinzo's iconic ability to completely shut down an entire subset of back row while looking incredibly cool was definitely what gave the card so much recognition and staying power. Much like Red Eyes, it started off as a card belonging to a goofy but fun villain, before becoming a key part of Joey's very eclectic monster lineup, getting plenty of spotlight in the anime. Despite receiving some on and off retrains over the years, Jinzo was never a fully realized archetype until a few years ago, making it a real curiosity for legacy support analysis. So naturally, we'll start off with the very first monster in the archetype, the renowned originator himself, Jinzo! Number 7. 7? As much as I'd love to say that it's an underrated playmaker in the archetype to this day, this is, in fact, a 500 attack direct attacker from 1999. It does have the dubious honor of having the highest stats among the early direct attackers, for all the situations when Rainbow Flower just doesn't cut it, but even that aspect would eventually be dethroned by some weird little snail bastard that came out in the same booster pack as Shape Snatch. The obvious joke to make here would be to ask what happened to Jinzo's 2 through 6, but frankly I don't think this even came from the same production line as the one we all know and love. Like, just imagine. Imagine. If this is number 7, then one of the earliest prototypes probably had a mandatory effect to attack the owner directly instead of the opponent. Conclusion? Instead of complaining, we should appreciate Konami's courtesy for skipping us immediately to number 7 because it could have been a lot worse. Anyway, Jinzo, the original. Kinda of feels deflating after that whole thing, but it's a level 6 machine with 2400 attack and 1500 defense, and the effect, trap cards and their effects on the field, cannot be activated. Negate all trap effects on the field. It probably doesn't seem like much today, when half the traps you see are archetypal extenders and the other half are these two, but Jinzo was an absolute beast at its time of release and stayed that way for quite a while. With the game's slower pace back in the day, a level 6 2400 body with an effect to disable a whole bunch of removal, control and stun cards was a pretty big deal. This was especially compounded by the fact that tribute monsters around this time rarely had good effects, if any at all, as evidenced by Jinzo having released alongside a fellow level 6 machine, the 1900 attack normal monster, Steel Ogre Grotto number 2. Yeah, this is a number 2 alright. This combination of stats and effect made it a competitive staple in a format where... Okay, I'm sorry, this has been bugging me ever since I was a kid. What's with a grotto? A grotto is a cave. I know early TCG localization is a unique type of mess, and there will be more on this topic in a minute, but this is a personal peeve of mine. There are five different monsters whose names were translated to a variant of Ogre Grotto, two pairs of which being made duos despite not having much visual resemblance to each other unlike other paired monsters, and unlike the two of them that weren't paired up, and only one of these five mentions something even remotely close to the word grotto in its original Japanese title, referring to where it comes from as opposed to what it is. I would make a joke along the lines of, I guess somebody in the TCG office was really into the word grotto one day, but knowing some of the anecdotes about what goes on in there, it probably wouldn't be too far from reality. What was I talking about? Right, so Jinzo was pretty awesome right off the bat, and remained that way for at least a decade, until Danko Seka showed up and kind of stole his thunder, despite having plenty of her own. Still, Jinzo keeps seeing occasional play to this day, usually in side decks, and his appreciation by the community cannot be overstated. Sure, the effect is a doozy, but part of the reverence definitely comes from the whole visual aspect of the card. Just in this limited frame, you have a tall, imposing figure in front of an eerie background, clad in a suit of armor composed of leather and steel, with spiked protrusions on its abnormally large neck, with the only really silly part being this zipper, but I guess even Jinzo needs to deal with humid weather conditions somehow. Atop all this stands a bloated cranium with a veiny, pink skin and a nailed-on, monstrous faceplate resembling a gas mask, with two eyepieces glowing red and staring directly at the viewer. It's an absolute bio-terror freak in the best way possible, and a great representation of early Yu-Gi-Oh! aesthetics, showcasing a combo of horror and style. Even Kazuki Takahashi's personal Jinzo artwork, featuring a striking color contrast and a more manga-style render, still retains the threatening Cenobite vibe that definitely inspired the original design. And because I haven't talked about this singular card enough yet, let me get back on the whole localization thing, because Jinzo's place in it is interesting to me. The monster's Japanese name is Jinzo Ningen Psycho Shoka, Jinzo Ningen literally meaning artificial human, but closely approximated to android, so that would be android Psycho Shocker. Early TCG had this odd 
tendency to translate codenames which were the Japanese pronunciation of an already English word into the romaji for the Japanese translation of that word, or even a completely different phrase sometimes, either in an attempt to, I don't know, make the game come off more exotic, or because they just thought it would be funny. Some of these names I like, others I think are stupid, and Jinzo falls into the cool category for me, because even though I was a little disappointed all that time ago when I found out it basically just means artificial, having a straightforward but unusual name and nothing else to the title was something I thought fit perfectly with the monster's menacing look. Mind you, Psycho Shocker is also a hell of a name, and still easily beats out the spell cancelling counterpart, the spell canceller. <laughs> Bravo. On one side, we have this sick, freaky cyborg with 2400 attack named Psycho Shocker because he shocks you with psycho powers. On the other side, we have this pathetic Goatsy drone with 1800 attack named Spell Canceller because it makes callouts on TikTok about why Monster Reborn is toxic. So yeah, Jinzo rocks all the way through. In a dedicated decklist, you wanna run three. The first addition to Jinzo's arsenal came in the form of a strange equip spell named Amplifier, initially used in dual monsters as an attack booster, and then in its printed form in early GX by... Jinzo. Like, the actual Jinzo. They had evil spirits capturing people's souls in the silence in season 1 and they treated it like a mild inconvenience. Like, oh, we took care of that guy, well, back to class. <laughs> it's a really Kafkaesque show if you think about it. The effect says equip only to Jinzo. This card's activation and effect cannot be negated. The equip monster's effect, trap cards and their effects on the field cannot be activated, negate all trap effects on the field, becomes your opponent cannot activate trap cards or their effects on the field, negate all trap effects your opponent controls. When this card leaves the field, destroy the equipped monster. Doing away with Jinzo's only downside, that being that he negates your own trap cards as well, Amplifier is really more of a novelty than a reliable asset. If you're running Jinzo, you're well aware of this compromise and are likely not stocking up on trap cards crucial to your game plan, at least not enough to run a back then unsearchable equip spell. It is, however, responsible for one of the funniest infinite loops in the game. You take a Jinzo, an Amplifier, Imperial Order, and just a little bit of snatch steel. <laughs> Heading off to the late GX support, used by a guy who felt like he wandered into the show about a hundred episodes too late, we first have Jinzo Returner. It's a level 3 with 600 attack and 1400 defense, with the effect, this card can attack directly. When this card is sent to the graveyard, you can target one Jinzo in your graveyard, special summon it, but destroy it during the end phase. I'll go out on a limb and say nobody was really clamoring for this loving tribute to Jinzo number 7 in the form of a slight effect update. The direct attack is irrelevant, and while the recovery condition misses timing and has a completely unnecessary end phase, pop, the second effect is something that warrants the card debatably being ran as a one-off due to enabling one of the less pathetic combos in the deck. Otherwise, it's an anime card through and through. Much like its follow-up, Jinzo Lord. A level 8 with 2600 attack and 1600 defense and the following effect. Cannot be normal summoned or set. Must be special summoned from your hand by sending one face-up Jinzo you control to the graveyard. Trap cards and their effects on the field cannot be activated. Negate all trap effects on the field. Once per turn, you can destroy as many face-up traps on the field as possible and if you do, inflict 300 damage to your opponent for each card destroyed. This one was always so baffling to me because it's barely an upgrade. You get 200 extra attack, then if by any chance there were some face-up trap cards left on the field from before Jinzo was summoned, you get to pop them for some minuscule burn damage. At least the anime version lets you look at the opponent's set cards in hand once per turn and then blow up all the revealed trap cards, even though it was used a bit different in the actual show, but the point remains. I guess this was too much for 2008, so they didn't go through with it, leaving us with a weird pointless boss monster. It's a shame because it did give us this cool looking sleek Jinzo with extra belt arms, but there's absolutely no reason to summon it. At the tail end of the Synchro era, we got one single piece of Jinzo support, which was curiously enough, a trap card. Blasphemy! Psychic Shockwave is a normal trap that says, when your opponent activates a trap card, discard one spell or trap, special summon one level 6 dark machine monster from your deck. Alright, it's not exactly a Jinzo card, but that's like saying Bug Matrix is not exactly a digital bug card. And I like this one because it's really petty. It adds a degree of interruption that wasn't present in the card before, enabling a certified Jinzo jumpscare. This actually was side decked competitively for a short time as a tech option because trap heavy decks could still run rampant in some older formats. Surely just 
just older formats. One interesting aspect of this card is the acknowledgement of Jinzo's place as an early psychic monster. The first additional type ever added to the game, many of the original psychics were portrayed as cybernetic mind manipulators similar to Jinzo in appearance, and if retroactively changing monster types was something they ever did, retconning Jinzo into a psychic would likely be how the concept got introduced. Hey Konami, I don't know what prompted this illusion thing, but there's still plenty of time for Relinquish to squeeze its way in there. You know, I think it's much more deserving of the spot than a Dark Duel Stories reference with Cornfield in the name. Call me. The last piece of standalone support Jinzo got before 2020 was the 2014 release Jinzo Jector. I can't believe the cowards skimped out on naming him Jinzo Jacker. What a loss. It's a level 4 with 800 attack and 2000 defense, and this card's name becomes Jinzo while on the field or in the graveyard. You can tribute this card, add one Jinzo monster from your deck to your hand except the Jinzo Jector, then reveal all set cards in your opponent's spell and trap zones, and if there are traps among them, you can special summon Jinzo monsters from your hand up to the number of traps revealed. We can only use this effect of Jinzo Jector once per turn. It's bizarre to me that a card with this much archetypal utility was released completely solo and remained that way for 6 years. This is a kind of effect that warrants at least 5 more cards being built around it to provide a modernized playstyle to an ancient monster, which did happen but they sure took their sweet time. Jector has so much going on. The Jinzo name copy so you can use it as a shortcut for support cards, it searches any Jinzo monster, not just the original, which it honestly didn't even need to at the time of release but it's appreciated right now, and it special summons multiple Jinzo in case you reveal multiple trap cards. Minus points for streamlining his neck though. Copy that. Sure, it's a bit slow, prone to negation and far from great on turn 1, but with the deck's current output it's a good 2 off. I guess that's a bit of a spoiler for the overall state of the deck's playability, but if you were hoping for the quote-unquote Jinzo playstyle to be anything more than a novelty toy, you were kinda setting yourself up for disappointment. Well, let's see how they pull it off, starting with Psychic Bounder. It's a level 4 machine, or at least it claims to be, he has 1700 attack and 1000 defense, and if this card is normal or special summoned, you can add one Jinzo or one spell or trap that specifically lists that card in its text from your deck to your hand. When another monster you control is attacked by an opponent's monster, before damage calculation, you can destroy both the attacking monster and discard. You can only use each effect of Psychic Bounder once per turn. This is a reasonably good searcher, as well as a decent retrain of Reflect Bounder. And much like Reflect Bounder, it's probably not gonna go off very often, but it's neat for searchers to have some battle effects on the field, and the deck is pretty lacking in protection anyway. When it comes to the searching, it covers any back row you might need, although it only fetches the original Jinzo when it comes to monsters, which can be a problem sometimes. Still, as far as the modern support goes, it's a staple for the deck. Next up is a retrain of the Fiend Mega Cyber, which was a warrior type, in the form of Psychic Mega Cyber, which is, of course, a machine. Is this a bad time to propose my pitch for the Pyrotype variant named Sea Serpent Mega Cyber? It's a level 6 with 2200 attack and 1200 defense, and if your opponent controls more spells and traps than you do, you can special summon this card from your hand. You can only special summon Psychic Mega Cyber once per turn this way. When this card declares an attack on an opponent's effect monster while you control Jinzo, you can tribute this card, place that opponent's monster face up in the spell and trap zone as a continuous trap. You can only use this effect of Psychic Mega Cyber once per turn. Well, credit where it's due, it does retain a special summoning condition which was the standout part of the Fiend Mega Cyber as a kind of prototype Cyber Dragon. It's a little different this time and still useless when going first, but hey, it's field presence. The battle effect is fascinating to me because it's such a roundabout way of jury-rigging the field state into conforming to Jinzo's new playstyle. Just in case the opponent is not flipping over any traps, Psychic Mega Cyber can punch a monster into the back row and make it act like its borders are pink. It requires setup to summon and activate, and the effect loses you the monster, but now you have access to a few more of the new Jinzo support effects, which honestly aren't really good enough to warrant going through all this trouble. Run one copy for emergency cases. The last main deck monster in this bunch is, curiously enough, a retrain of Jinzo. To be honest, I sat here for a few minutes trying to workshop a joke about this thing's name or appearance, but it's called Jinzo the Machine Menace, and the artwork is a Dutch angle Jinzo shooting laser beams at you, so I don't think anything I added would be nearly as funny. It's got the same stats as Jinzo, other than being level 7, and its effect says if a trap is face up on the field or in either graveyard, you can special summon this card from your hand, and if you do, it becomes level 6 until the end of this turn. During either player's main phase, you can tribute this card, special summon one Jinzo from your hand or graveyard, then you can destroy all traps your opponent controls, and if a card is set, reveal it. You can only use each effect of Jinzo the Machine Menace once per turn. This is a strange card, because it basically incentivizes you to run easily accessible traps in your Jinzo deck just so you can reliably turn it into less of a brick. Either run foolish burial goods to set up some traps with graveyard effects, or hope you get to slap down an Imperm or evenly mashed in case you're going second. It's handy that the level changes to 6 upon this summoning condition, enabling Xyz plays, but my question in that regard is, why is it level 7 in the first place? For the manga reference? 
I appreciate it, but what I would appreciate even more is a less stunted card. The second effect is kinda neat, if at least from the perspective of giving the deck a semblance of interruption, even though you won't be using it for that most of the time. The ability to summon the original Jinso from the hand, or even recycle it along with Jector, all the while giving you the option to clear out traps, is a decent enough package of effects, but overall I wish there was more to this. It's not a menace as much as an annoyance. The final monster in this lineup is the Jinzo Xyz monster, the rank 6 Jinzo Layered. Again, he's got the Jinzo stats, requires any two level 6 monsters, and you can detach one material from this card, then target one face-up monster your opponent controls, take control of it until the end phase, but it cannot activate its effects or declare an attack. If a trap is on the field, you can tribute one monster, and if you do, destroy one face-up card on the field. You can only use each effect of Jinzo Layered once per turn. This sudden shift into a monster control focus was something that initially piqued my curiosity. Esper Roba employed Hypnosis and and mind control in his duels, spectator mode notwithstanding, so updating Jinzo's playstyle from archaic trap manipulation into something that fits the psychic disposition was a great idea. From this aspect, Layered is… okay. The monster you steal can be used for Link or Xyz plays, such as Sheridan, which feels right at home here, as vampires also had a similar control focus makeover for their modern support. Alternatively, you can use it for removal if a trap card is on the field, which is, once again, such a weird failing for this deck. At least Buster Blader was based around eliminating dragons, which meant active engaging in battle with monsters, while all Jinzo ever did was passively prevent a form of disruption which is barely even used for that purpose anymore. Trying to cobble together a playstyle for a monster whose sole thing is disabling traps is a strange endeavor and clearly not a successful one when you make a bunch of crucial effect utility reliant on traps still being active. This deck operates under the impression that the opponent will be flipping over a new, exciting, likely continuous trap each turn and somehow not be dominating the board state while doing so, while also trying to sabotage them from doing that, all the while frequently struggling to build up its own field presence. What is card design? Right, so layer is whatever, you can run away, but he will catch up to you with his long feet. The deck's only normal spell is Law of the Cosmos. Your opponent can set one trap directly from their hand or deck. Then if they did, special summon one Jinzo from your deck. If they did not, add one Jinzo or one monster that specifically lists that card in its text from your deck to your hand. You can only activate one Law of the Cosmos per turn. It's always a dire state of affairs when your archetypal search spell comes with a chance of giving the opponent a free card. Sure, you get a Jinzo, which might cause that trap to stay down for a little bit, but if they ever get rid of said Jinzo or you use it for an extra deck play without a back up, the trap card in question will likely be something that throws a wrench into your place big time. Alternatively, you might get to search any of the support monsters with it, such as Jector, Bounder and Menace, all of which could put in decent work towards your game plan, but even though both of the results net you a card, letting the opponent decide what happens is gonna result in a less optimal outcome more often than not. At least it doesn't require a trap card to be on the field. Next up is the first quick play spell, Everlasting Alloy. If you control Jinzo, activate one of these effects. All machine monsters you currently control cannot be destroyed by your opponent's card effects until the end of the turn, or when a card or effect is activated that targets a machine monster you control, negate that effect. Is there any particular reason as to why this wasn't a continuous spell? If you want to make me pick between resistance to destruction or targeting, that's fine. It can be a passive effect as long as I control a Jinzo monster, and if I don't, just blow up the card. I just can't stand one-off protection quick plays, especially in a deck that struggles out the ass to search basic playmakers, and this is a prime example. It's a shame because the archetype absolutely lacks protection, but running this would actively interfere with you making any actual plays. The next quick play is Cyber Energy Shock. It says, if you control Jinzo, target one card on the field, destroy it, then if it was a trap, you can apply one of these effects. Negate the effects of one face-up card on the field until the end of this turn, or all Jinzo you control gain 800 attack. You can only activate one Cyber Energy Shock per turn. This is the closest thing the deck's got to a modern semblance of control. Again, it depends on the field presence of the original Jinzo, the Originzo, if you will, and you have to blow up a trap if you want some spot negation or attack boosting, meaning the situation has to be very specific for you to get the most out of this card. It's a mess, but it falls in line with the rest of the deck, so you gotta run 3. Frankly, I'm just glad it's a quick play, and it's a genuine surprise that the attack boost is permanent instead of lasting until somebody blinks. The last Jinzo quick play is Psychic Wave. If you control a machine monster, send one Jinzo from your hand or deck to the graveyard, inflict 600 damage to your opponent. During your main phase, except the turn this card was sent to the graveyard, you can banish this card from your graveyard, then target one machine monster in your graveyard, send one Jinzo monster from your deck to the graveyard, and if you do, add a targeted monster to your hand. 
where from is it the graveyard? You can only use this effect of Psychic Wave once per turn. If you couldn't tell by the out-of-place burn effect and the Academy Dual Disc on the artwork, this is an adaptation of an ancient anime card. Admittedly, it does add a bit of semi-generic recycling to it, but in a very slow and unwieldy manner, and basically begging you to use Returner with it. The fact that you can retrieve any machine monster with it is appreciated because you can regain access to your playmakers, that is, unless you got OTK'd before the card can go off. It's a decent combo enabler in a deck that sorely lacks any, but having to wait a turn to use it feels borderline evil and I have no idea why that line of text is here. You run a few of these if you want to risk also running Returner. The final Jinzo card is Cosmos Channeling. It's a continuous spell that says, you can send one monster you control that is owned by your opponent to the graveyard, special summon one machine monster from your hand or graveyard. When your opponent draws for their normal draw in their draw phase while you control Jinzo, you can declare one card type, monster, spell or trap, your opponent reveals the card they drew, and if it is the declared card type, send this card to the graveyard and if you do, draw one card. You can only use each effect of Cosmos Channeling once per turn. So, the first effect is just kind of annoying. Even with a copy of Mind Control and Change of Heart, this deck does not pull off nearly enough monster stealing shenanigans to warrant this activation cost. I will give it some credit as it's a continuous spell and this is meant to be used more to ensure the opponent doesn't get their resources back rather than a designated recycling tool. The second effect on the other hand just makes me mad. Having to control Jinzo, letting this brick sit on the field until the opponent's draw phase and having to guess what type of card they drew in an archetype that has no ways of learning this information by itself only for you to lose a card you control just so you can get a single solitary draw, that's when anime references cross the line from being cute to becoming a danger for tournament play. Sorry, what I meant to say was, another great combo with Convulsion of Nature. The Jinzo Gishki variant definitely has a competitive future. A freak accident has caused a panda-shaped can opener to be lodged inside of my occipital lobe for the past 8 months. I'm afraid it may be developing some grey matter of its own. Help me, TCG. Let's give Konami some bad middle school flashbacks by grading their science project. Consistency gets a 2. You pretty much need to go second to even enable half of your plays, and even then, most of your search options are kind of clunky. This deck cannot build its best board before turn 3, and the board in question isn't very good in the first place. Power also gets a 2. The archetype is based around a sub midrange beater and adamantly refuses to evolve past that in terms of stats, it's miserably bad at OTKs for a deck that wants to go second, and its removal options are sparse to say the least. The only thing resembling decent damage output here are very specific jacker plays in combination with a cyber energy shock attack boost. As for recovery, the deck does partially rely on it for a few plays, but they're too few and far between to count. Psychic Wave is the highlight on this front, but even that requires you to play Returner and hope you don't die before the effect activates. I'm afraid that's a 1. But it's a strong 1! Protection exists in the form of Bounder's rarely used attack interception and a terrible quick play, and that's about it. This is a weak 1. But it's not a zero! Versatility-wise, it's weird. They took a monster intended to disable the slowest and least proactive type of card in the game, and then tried building a whole deck around the idea, but decided not to make it do much else? The most damning thing about the archetype is that even if you're playing against trap-centric decks, modern ones tend to have plenty of non-trap-related ways to circumvent Jinzo's ability and easily get rid of him. If you're running an engine to get your stuff out faster, the Jinzo side of things actively hampers the performance of that engine rather than being enhanced by it. It may be harsh, but if a deck is made to counter a specific type of playstyle and then can't even do that properly, I don't see anything fitting here but another one. Here's a deck list. Thank you Konami for designing this archetype in a way that forces me to run 6 trap cards, truly a respectful tribute to Jinzo's legacy, which, to be honest, probably didn't have to exist regardless of quality. The original monster is such a basic but well-rounded card that stood the test of time in the competitive scene way better than most of its contemporaries. Even disregarding meta-relevancy, Jinzo was always one of the coolest creations of the Duel Masters era, and the simplicity of its effect will ensure it always stays that way. All these extra bells and whistles are neat, low playability aside, but I'm of the opinion that it feels like an extra extraneous update to a card which never needed one. It's like if you surrounded the Mona Lisa's museum display with a bunch of Mona Lisa fan art. Still, despite the significantly lower trap focus in the modern game and his protege Denko Seka filling in for him, Jinzo still occasionally finds his way into some side decks and will always remain one of the most recognizable monsters in the game. From the appearance and presence in the show to the effect, it's a definition of an iconic monster and there is no mediocre support wave that will ever change that. So, this is Bubble Blaster. I made it for my friend Bubble Man after his buddy Avion got tragically destroyed by battle with a Purely the other day. Hope this makes old Bubble stay with us for a couple more turns. Uh, don't take battle damage, take uh, Bubble Blaster. Peace. Steampunk is good for you.
no downsides for now. Goodbye. Yeah, my lifelong friend, Giant Germ, who I met at the dumpster the other day, got hit by a patroid and died. There were two more of him immediately after, but I still miss the old one. If he were here, I would dedicate this to him, this germ infection. But as he is not, I will simply demonstrate it myself. The cool thing about the germ infection is it's really easy to make it at home by yourself. We're at the toilet bowl. What is this? Get off the podium! I can't. The thing nobody understands about me, I'm actually very smart. I have a degree in physics, I have a degree in chemistry, I have a degree in sociology, I have a degree in anthropology. Uh, I'm entirely self-taught, I gave myself all those degrees, but it took a, a long time to write them, so I'm pretty sure they're about as, as valid as any other degree.